this is Justin Blinko. Welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Today, I speak with Charles Moore. Charles, who also goes by Chuck, is a realtor at Your Castle Real Estate in Denver, Colorado. He is also a founding partner at Gearheart Moore Holdings, LLC, and broker slash owner at Capital Works Mortgage. In today's conversation, we talk about getting into the mortgage business, the somewhat shady strategies that Wells Fargo would use to get people to refinance, getting renters to pay for your house and office, developing real estate, why Denver real estate prices have shot up recently, and Chuck's forecast for Denver's real estate future. You can find show notes with links to this and all other interviews at libertyentrepreneurs.com. We're a new podcast working to build an audience. If you found this show valuable, please follow us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast or Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. We're also on iTunes and giving us a rating on there would really help us out. Charles, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Can you tell us what you're up to currently? Uh, yeah, we're, well, we're basically trying to grow our rental portfolio because, you know, our whole idea is we want to try to make more money while we're sleeping, you know, so we can not work when we're awake. Great idea. So, and that's how, and the only way we're going to get there, you know, is with, at least with our skill set, knowing what we know is really by doing rentals, you know. Um, I'm not banking on stock market and all that. I mean, I, I invest in that stuff, but, um, you know, I, I, my dad got laid off when I was a junior in college and he had... I think he had five buildings with a total of like 40 tenants and he bought everything in the early eighties and paid them off. And so when he got laid off, he just, you know, I think he looked around for a job for, you know, maybe a couple months and he just said, screw it. You know, he had a pretty good amount of money coming in off the rentals free and clear. And so that's really kind of where our goal has been. And me and Ben kind of have some of our own stuff going and we have some joint, uh, you know, rental projects, but that's kind of the whole idea is, you know, just have a good, reliable property manager we can trust. And then, uh, you know, as the rental income increases, uh, you know, we do these projects, we can pay the debt down. So hopefully, you know, within maybe even five years, we could have a good number of rentals paid off and just, you know, hopefully keep them full. When did you first realize that being an entrepreneur was something that you wanted to do? You know, I, I think I kind of had a, uh, I don't know if you call it a knack for it or whatever you want, but at a young age, cause I remember even I would pick all the fruits and vegetables out of my parents' garden growing up and, uh, throw them in my wagon and take them around and sell, sell them to all the neighbors. Awesome. Uh, you know, and yeah, and I got in trouble for that, but <laughs> you know, it gave me a little bit of walking around money back then. Uh, you know, even if it was only a few bucks you make, but it was a pretty easy sell and you know, it didn't cost me anything. So, <laughs> and how did you go from out. agriculture so very, to very real high estate? Margins. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If you could only get those margins today. Right. Yeah. Well, no. And then I had a paper route. That was like pretty much the earliest legitimate job you could get growing up. I think you'd get a paper route at 11 or 12. And, uh, and I was, that was a terrible paper route boy though. I would always show up and do it, but I didn't like doing it alone. I liked hanging out with my friends. So I'd actually pay my friend more than I even earned on the route, which was obviously terrible business. Right. <laughs> but, uh, so that didn't work out very well, but you know, the days that I didn't have help, uh, worked out. So, uh, paper out wasn't a good business venture for me, but it was fun and got going on it. And then, uh, it was a bus and tables at village Inn at 14. I was cooking at restaurants and then, uh, you know, really I, you know, went through college and did all that, got my economics degree. And then my first actual kind of working for myself deal was me and two buddies moved to Telluride uh, when we graduated from Iowa in January 2003. And they got kind of normal jobs working in town, or we all did. Um, and then we decided that we were going to – one of the guys was out in Las Vegas and saw the oxygen bars where you actually pay money to breathe air, <laughs> which was kind of interesting. But he claimed you know, it was kind of a high and got euphoric, and we never tried it out. We just put in, I think, 8000 bucks to buy one of these oxygen bars off these guys in Massapequa. Uh, was that New Jersey or New York out there? But So we got this thing into Colorado. We originally had it set up for the X Games, which would have been – X games at Butterbill and Aspen 2003. And then they kind of got scared and said we couldn't set it up because they were worried about blowing up, even though it didn't have oxygen tanks. So that would have been a nice, uh, nice venue for us, but it didn't work out. So really what we did is we just went around a nightclub setting this thing up and we would charge people a dollar a minute to breathe, literally <laughs> breathe, breathe, breathe air. But it was, it was from your high vegetable margins to oxygen. I can I can see a trend here. Yeah, no, yeah. We like car. Mar I mean, high margins good when you're an entrepreneur. Uh, and so, you know, we, we would work deal, but we, you know, in Vegas, they charge you a dollar a minute. We found that that wasn't working out very well here. So we would basically sell 
you know, the nose candles you'd put on and we would just sell $5 all you could breathe for the whole night. We're at the nightclub <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was busy. And so, you know, but we weren't really making a ton of money. It was basically enough to, you know, kind of go to the next deal and have a little bit of fun and pay for tank gas here and there. But the whole, the whole idea was to sell these oxygen bars to the nightclubs or to ta- tanning salons. Cause supposedly you got your tanner when you're in the beds because you had more oxygen flowing through you. <laughs> And so we sold a couple of them, um, but it wasn't as easy of a, as a sell as we thought it was originally going to be. And I even took it all the way down to uh, spring break in Panama City and set it up, whereas at Harpoon Harry's nightclub for a whole week. And it was, I was making pretty good money down there because it was busy, you know, from five to, you know, four in the morning. Yeah. Um, and then took it to New Orleans. But then after that, it just kind of, you know, we realized this wasn't going to make us a lot of money. So we ended up selling our oxygen deal to a, uh, a nightclub down in Colorado Springs. I'm sure they probably don't even have it anymore. And then uh, I moved back to Iowa at that point and then just got a normal job working at Geico, uh, you know, selling insurance. Mm-hmm. And that was, uh, that move was really more dictated by this gal I was dating to get back there. And then, you know, I just got that job. But, uh, you know, it was just one of those deals where every day I was in there selling insurance, like my blood would boil probably multiple points throughout the day. Um, you know, I would constantly just think about working for myself. And so even while I was there working, I was studying for my real estate exam back in Iowa. And then, um, my dad having the real estate he owned in Cedar Falls, Iowa, uh, you know, I literally put like, I think a check for $6 in the mail to get a book on the zoning code for Cedar Falls. Um, so, I mean, I had a pretty strong interest in development and zoning, you know, before I even really even owned any of my own property, you know, so I read that whole zoning book from front to back and tried to talk to my dad and do, uh, you know, go in highest and best use with his with some of his real estate. But, you know, he's pretty secure and not really open to that, especially for a guy that, you know, had never even put a shovel in the ground to build anything yet. So even back then, I kind of had, you know, pretty strong interest in that kind of line of work. But when I quit Geico, I moved out here and took a job at the Wells Fargo doing lending just so I could get moved out here. I actually took a pretty big pay cut for that. And then, you know, it kind of, you know, I was already in lending and then I moved into that working for my, I basically went out on my own in May of 07 to just do mortgages. And back then you didn't have to be licensed. So like a lot of guys even selling cars would be selling cars and selling mortgages on the lot too. But, uh, you know, we went through that huge mortgage crisis where, you know, basically if you had a pulse, you could get a mortgage, no money down, you know, state of income, which caused a lot of that fallout or probably pretty much all the fallout. Um, from that last great recession, yeah. but, uh, but I stuck with it, you know, I did, had very low overhead, so I kind of got my knuckles scraped. It was probably the worst time you could get into the mortgage business, but, uh, you know, if you could stick, stick with it, you know, I mean, I'd like to think I'm a pretty hard worker and I'm a smart guy, but at the end of the day, a lot of it was just timing. Uh, but we got through, we got through all the kind of that slow time with mortgages just because when I worked at Wells Fargo, I realized that it was, it was subprime lending when I got into, and I didn't know I was going to be doing that when I took the job. But then, uh, you know, they were charging people basically the way Wells Fargo financial would make money is they would send those checks out in the mail, you know, and everybody's got them or it's like a check for a thousand bucks. And then it says on the back in small print, if you cash it, you owe us, you know, $40 a month for the next 36 months. And it works out to about a 20% loan. But more importantly, when you cash that check, Wells Fargo gets a copy of your credit report. And when they get that credit report, they know if you own a home and they see all your other debt. And so what they would do is they would send those checks out. And if you cashed them, that would be a pretty hot lead because you'd call them up and say, hey, we see you own a home and you owe this much on it. We think it's worth this much and you have all this credit card debt. Why don't we refinance it? We're going to save you a thousand bucks a month. Well, what they were doing is they were taking people out of normal 30-year mortgage that they probably already been paying on for a few years and stretching them into a 40-year mortgage on a three-year arm. And they were charging them exorbitant closing cost fees in the front, like 4% origination. So, you know, on a $200,000 loan, that'd be eight, eight grand, which is basically stripping their equity out. And so, I mean, as soon as I got into that job, I realized I couldn't do that and I was trying to get out. Yeah, that's a um, brilliant marketing strategy, a, a questionable business practice. But Exactly, yeah. It's, uh, you know, you just don't feel good about yourself when you're, they tell you that's what you got to, you know, go out and do for, do for a living every day. Yeah. So, uh, but when I got out working for myself, you know, I was, I was basically in a, a mortgage broker, you know, with the whole gamut of mortgage products, you know, at my disposal. 
And so what I found out pretty quick after I went out on my own is that you can get public records. So we, I, I basically went to my title, one of my title guys, and just said, hey, can you get me every Wells Fargo financial mortgage in the state of Colorado? And so I had this list, I think it was like 600 records that came up, which basically means 600 people in the state of Colorado had a Wells Fargo financial mortgage. So I knew these people were good borrowers because they were fully, you know, they were showing their income, they had decent credit. Um, and they might have still had some equity left in their house. And so we went through, me and Ben, and that's when Ben joined me, and we started going through and just basically cold calling these people and saying, hey, how's your Wells Fargo financial mortgage working out? And immediately they would just go off on a rant about how much they didn't like that company. And so we were taking these people and putting them in FHA loans because you only needed to have like 2 or 3% equity in your house. So if they were tight, you know, some people had more equity than that, but some people qualified for conventional. But I mean, there was people we were doing a rate and term refinance on, uh, which means we weren't consolidating credit card debt or doing any of that. We were just basically taking their mortgage and refinancing it straight away. We were doing it for, you know, minimal fees and saving people five, six hundred bucks a month. But that was a nice little niche for us to be working because you felt good about what you're doing. You were saving people a ton of money. We were making money, staying busy. And then really once the mortgages uh, mortgage rates dropped. I think it was December 17th, 2008. They dropped from like four, five, five and three quarters down to four and a half. And it was just crazy. I mean, I think we locked like 30 loans that first day, which usually we close, you know, we're not a big shop. Usually we do like maybe a hundred loans a year. So locking 30 loans in one day is, is a big, especially big back day. then because we weren't doing as much. Right. Uh, the problem was, is, you know, lenders went from doing a refinance or purchase in 30 days to like 120 because right. they, they, I mean, they just weren't prepared for that kind of volume. But um, so then we were doing, you know, mortgages, basically, you know, we've been doing them ever since, but, uh, we've been pretty much as busy as you wanted to be. Uh, and then a lot of other people started getting back in the business and all that. But, uh, we decided to start our own mortgage company, like I said, about two and a half years ago. And it's been really good. We don't, we're not trying to grow huge, you know, we're just trying to take care of, you know, basically kind of our, our customer and referral base. But, you know, we try to really maintain a high level customer service, answering our phone and respond to emails really quickly. And we keep our overhead real low. When you and I met, I was recommended to you word of mouth and you became my real estate agent and also yep. my mortgage broker from getting to know you in the, the years since, you know, I've realized that you uh, have as much business as you want because you've you know built a business of taking care of clients. But it, it obviously wasn't all that always that way. And, you know, you've been through a lot of insurance jobs and different places where you're, you're cold calling customers. Do you have any advice? What what's the strategy for successfully, you know, picking up the phone, talking to someone and convincing them that you can actually solve their problem? Uh, well, I think some people are probably more talented than me on cold calls. Like, you know, my business partner, Ben, you could probably just give him the white pages and just like a two minute rundown and he'll just start calling. Uh, you know, for me, I need to have a higher level of confidence if I'm going to call somebody. So, you know, I need to know I'm, I'm calling them with a value add, you know, and not just trying to sell them something. Uh, you know, so the Wells Fargo financial was a pretty easy sell because I knew, I knew the situation they were in and I knew I could put them in a lot better situation and I knew mortgages really well. Right. And so right. for me, for me personally, um, you know, having a strong knowledge base on whatever you're trying to sell is important just cause it gives me, you know, a high level of confidence to talk about it. Uh, and you but, saw the you know, pain that those clients were in from having put some of them in there as an employee oh, yeah. at Wells Fargo. So you could kind of say you, you knew exactly what, what they where they were hurting and had a solution to their problem. Yeah, so for me it was an easy sell, you know, doing that. And then now, you know, we might cold call on development plays where we're targeting a certain zoning code, and so we call somebody up and we just say, hey, you know, we're we're looking to buy your house based on this zoning. You know, want to give you fair market value, and we don't do a whole lot of that, but uh, you know, it just it, it, for me it's just easy to to cold call if you know what you're talking about. I think as an entrepreneur, you have to have, you have, I mean, you have to be fearful, I guess. I mean, you just naturally are. But, you know, if you have no fear, that's an edge up for sure in, in being an entrepreneur. Right. And I'm not saying I have that, but, uh, you know, to a certain degree, I guess I do. Yeah. You've, if you didn't have, if you weren't born with it, you've learned it over uh, and refined it over a number of jobs yeah. and years of doing yeah. it. Yeah. Selling oxygen bars, I got the door slammed in my face a lot. <laughs> Yeah, those people uh, selling yeah. oxygen to people that can already breathe is kind of like the uh, an analogy is, to yeah. selling ice to an Eskimo. Yeah, I remember I used to drive up and down I-70, and I just go into every little business on all those small towns and tanning salons, bars, and yeah, that was a tough sell for sure. Yeah, but, but that was a good learning experience. It was, yeah, absolutely. So you were getting into you got your real estate uh, brokerage license. Yeah, it was always in the back of my head. What if rates go back up to where they were at at six, you know, and we don't have a niche like the Wells Fargo financial thing to sell to. 
um, you know, it just always kind of concerned me. So I wanted to kind of broaden what we were doing and, you know, just make sure we had, you know, some other revenue streams. So I decided, you know, I was just going to, I mean, you can't make hours in the day, but I was just going to put the extra hours in at night, weekends, whatever, just to, you know, get through the licensing and get my real estate license. And I always liked doing it. So it was just something I, I felt like I should probably get. And then uh, I got licensed January 2011. And, uh, you know, it was a pretty easy transition for us because we already had a pretty good base of, you know, real estate related clients anyway, between doing mortgage purchases and refinances. But I ended up selling, I think, 14 houses my first year, which for your castle was like where I hang my license. I was rookie of the year. And that was like a lot better than most people that had their license for 10 years been doing. Cause I think the average agent sells like six or seven houses a year. And then 2011, let's see, 2011 was my first year license. So 2012, I think I did like 40 some deals. And then 2012, I think I did 60, 2013, I think I did almost a hundred. Wow. And then, yeah, and then Ben got licensed as well on real estate. So we're basically both licensed mortgage brokers. He handles more of that side of the business. But then now we're both kind of doing about the even amount of real estate deals because now we have development taken away from both our time. But we, we still do about a hundred deals a year. So I think we're one of the top you know, top, I guess, teams or whatever, if you want to call it in the state. So, you know, we like to think we, you know, we know what we're doing and we have pretty good experiences through the, you know, the amount of volume that we're doing on deals. Yeah. And then, uh, and that kind of naturally led it was actually, we got into the development. I mean, kind of when I was trying to do my own house, I always like keeping my overhead low. I mean, I think that is being an entrepreneur. That's just the huge piece of it. You know, if you go out and just start getting yourself into high overhead with super nice house and car and all that, it's just, kind of sets you up for disaster if you're going to do a low piece. So, I mean, ever since I bought it, my first house in Colorado uh, was over in Capitol Hill and I bought it for $103,000 in 07. And I, and my payment was 900 bucks a month and I had a roommate that paid five, right? So my overhead's four. I mean, you better be able to roll out that and make 400 bucks a month or you got, you got bigger problems. Yeah. You know, and then my next house, we actually moved in with my, current wife with girlfriend at the time i bought a house for a hundred thousand bucks my payment on that was seven hundred dollars a month she moved in and split it with me and then she was my fiance i got her into a hud home where she was a teacher so we got the house for half price or she did wow um so she got a house for 120 in the but then we actually got it for 60 was her mortgage on it so then we were living you know with hoa on it we were living for 700 <clears throat> the and then we got a development on my next deal where we were looking to move and I bought a house that was zoned duplex and instead of tearing it down I built it built a new house next door to it um so I basically got the land kind of for free and this is back at the end of 2012 when the real estate market was starting to heat up pretty good but the development nobody's really building quite yet and so I built my house and basically I've got you know my the other half of my I guess duplex if you want to call it that pays basically my whole mortgage minus 300. So I live in a pretty nice house for $300 a month right now, which is actually my lowest, you know, personal overhead for living. I've had my whole time. I've actually been in Colorado for 10 years. And so I've, you keep improving I, I, this, this ratio. Oh yeah. And I by far have the nicest house that I've lived in. And then I've got even another better deal going right now, right in the middle of lower Highlands at 32nd Quivis. I'm doing on an old historic project. So I should actually be not only uh, living for free, but actually making about 500 bucks a month once I pull that deal off. For someone that's not a real estate agent, how do you find these deals? Uh, it's all zoning plays, really. So, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, I think investors are just, you know, people out looking for their first house. Well, kind of like when you you were looking for your first, right? Mm -hmm. You said, hey, man, I want a two-bed, two-bath minimum at this price point. And that's just what we set out to look for. And so, you know, over the last few years, I basically, I mean, at least for my own purchases and a lot of the developers I work with, I don't, I don't really care about bedroom, bath or anything. I'll have my searches set up, you know, for the different zoning codes. So I'll, in Denver, for example, I've got zoning codes set up where it's just MX, RH, MU, SU, TU. I mean, basically there's probably 10 or 12 different zoning, zoning codes in Denver. There's a little bit, a few layers on top of those, but that's all I really have my searches set up on. So you can you explain you what know, those abbreviations mean for those? Yeah. Those so for example, days. like uh, MX would be for mixed use, which is probably the most desirable zoning code in Denver. So I have it set up as soon as a property hits MLS and has MX zoning, I get it on my phone. Right. And then, you know, and I don't really care what the lot size is or price or anything. I just, I'm going to look at it. And then within a couple minutes, I can really even like 30 seconds, I can evaluate if it's worth even looking at, you know, further, or I just delete it and say that one's not going to work. 
I know a lot of people pay attention to the market. This is January 2016 as we're talking. Um, what, yep. what is going on with the Denver market? Obviously, it's heating up and it's hard to, you know, there's not much inventory. What, you know, what's what's going on and what what do you predict over the next time period that you feel confident predicting? Uh, you know, it kind of felt like it was slowing down a little bit over the last month or two, but I didn't know if that was just truly the market or if it was just me because I have so many projects going. I, you know, I was going to get nervous holding the bag if something happened. Uh, but I actually went to a market, kind of an advanced market trends class the owner of your castle put on for a small group of us. And I mean, I walked out of there feeling a lot more bullish about the Denver market than I had before. And it kind of just reaffirmed some ideas I had about it. Because really, I mean, I think the only thing that, that's going to slow Denver down is if, uh, you know, all these the 50 or 100,000 people a month quit moving here. Right. Um, you know, because that's really what's driving it right now. And, you know, we kind of worry just with the because, I mean, right now, just between me and my business partner, we're we're principals, which means, you know, we're signing on the debt. We have our money in, involved on probably over 80 units. Wow. And then, you know, between me and the developers are uh, the stuff we have going to the developers I work with. I bet we have I mean, I don't have enough, you know, down to a exact number but i bet it's over 200 units you know that we're pr- we're pretty much planning on delivering through the end of 2017 and you know if the market holds up we'll just continue to buy infill lots and keep stacking on that pipeline but you know so it's a big concern for me because i don't want to wake up one morning and realize i've got all these projects going and not have any buyers left yeah so you're, you're not a, a real estate agent that's just promoting people to buy because you make the commission you've got real skin in the game and what happens oh yeah so, so yeah absolutely. you're, you're, you're yeah. looking at this very closely yeah, and our business model, you know, we there's a lot of people out there that, you know, will just go out and start specking out six, seven hundred thousand dollar townhome units, and that's not really our business model. I like, I like sticking to end products that we can sell for half a million or even four fifty or less, just because you know with Denver getting as expensive as it is, four fifty is actually a pretty affordable price point here anymore. Yeah, um, even just for a townhome or you know half a duplex. I mean half duplex you can't even get for four fifty really anymore. So it's more like townhome. You know, the thing is, is land is getting so expensive in Denver. I mean, it used to be you could get a duplex lot over in northwest Denver for, you know, 275 or 300 just 18 months to maybe two years ago. And now they're selling for 450 So, you know, as the price of that land goes up, obviously, you know, what goes on the land needs to go up as well. People are worried about like a glut of inventory coming on the market, you know, driving prices down. But I just don't see where that inventory is going to come from. They're not making any more land, obviously. And the land's so expensive that whatever people put on the land, they're, you know, they, you got to sell at a higher price per square foot. Right. So, you know, I think the only thing that would slow it down would obviously be demand of existing inventory. So, you know, a lot of what's driving this is all these people moving here. I think they said it used to be 50, it was 50,000 a month, but then there was a number that came out that said like almost a million people moved here last year, which really puts that number closer to like 80 or 90 a month. So, you know, if that somehow slows down, which I guess, you know, if people you know, don't have jobs available when they move here or who knows what, you know, then obviously we're going to lose a ton of buyers because I'll admit, you know, at the end of the day, all these people moving here, they got to have a roof over their head. And that's kind of what I like about real estate is, you know, having a roof over your head is never going to go out of style. So, you know, whether I'm in the rental business, it's like breathing, exactly right. You know, it's a necessity. So why are people moving to Denver? As I travel the world, the big news of Denver is obviously legalized marijuana. And when I say that, yeah, real estate prices are going up, they're like, yeah, everyone's moving there uh, because of legalized weed. I assume there's a lot of factors driving it. Yeah, I hear the weed thing, too. And I mean, I mean, I've, you know, we're, we're pretty active agents and I show a lot of buyers around and even meet a lot of buyers on job sites with their agents because we, you know, we can't have them run around without hard hats and stuff. So I get to talk to a lot more buyers than I you know, that I even normally do just running around in my car showing homes. And, uh, I don't really feel like any of these people here are moving here because of marijuana. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Cause I mean, I think this marijuana thing is probably going to start moving to other States and, you know, if it gets legalized in 15, 20, 30 more States, then obviously it's not going to be a novelty to come to Colorado and, and smoke marijuana or eat right. brownies or whatever. Um, but I remember, you know, when I first visited here, I came to Colorado was my sophomore year of college to ski trip out in Telluride and coming from Iowa, you know, we have snow, but we only have 200 days of sunshine. And when the snow hits, it sticks. It, it's not gone until like April. Uh, you know, and I came out here and I couldn't believe like how nice it was. You know, you could walk around in Denver with a t-shirt on in the middle of March, which is not usually happening in Iowa. And then you, even when you go out to Telluride, you know, at higher elevation, it was still like, you know, pretty, pretty nice, uh, weather. And so, 
I mean, I think a lot of people just assume Denver is just covered in snow year round. And when you know, you come out to visit or, you know, you have all these people moving here, kind of spreading the word. It's just almost like just a snowball effect that, you know, it's kind of like the secrets out. It's interesting because I was actually, we're starting to do a little bit of business in Kansas City just with the prices in Denver getting to where they're at. So we were in Kansas City about a month ago and I'm actually going there again here at the end of the week. You know, I was, but I was going around to Kansas City after the visit, and I was like, you know, this is actually a pretty nice town. I mean, you're going to these same little kind of trendy bars and restaurants just like we have here in Denver. But, you know, when you live in Kansas City, you know, cost of living is lower, which is great. But, you know, you don't have Breckenridge or Vail or Keystone, you know, within 70, 90 miles from you. Yeah, exactly. You yes. know, and I just think uh, – I mean, I think that's a huge difference is, you know, because the, the, the climate in Kansas City is great. They got more water than we do there if you want to go boating and stuff. But, you know, I think just the fact that you have, you know, true world class skiing, you know, you could go do a quick half day at Breck. I mean, I do that quite a bit, just as busy as I am and not want to deal with weekend traffic. And I would imagine as the, you know, Internet economy starts to spread and, and people more and more can choose where they want to live, you know, they don't have to live where they you know, where the job is, they can go where they desire, you know, right. more, more desirable places will have uh, population inflows. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, it's like, well, I was mentioned briefly, you know, I don't really go skiing on the weekends that much. So usually I'll just grab another bunny with a flexible schedule that's self-employed or, you know, kind of whoever can go, you know, if it's me, just me or one other guy or two and head up to even a basin. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people won't even know I'm gone because I can, you know, a basin doesn't have great cell coverage as you probably remember, but yeah. You know, you can go to that back Montezuma Bowl and uh, you get great coverage on that chairlift. You almost get, you know, 4G coverage back there. So you can you can just whip out 10 runs and just hammer out emails and phone calls on your way up the chairlift. <laughs> yeah, and nobody awesome. even nobody even knows you're out of the office and you grab a beer at, you know, the Six Alley Bar and you're back in the office by 1 or 2 o'clock. Yeah, pretty, pretty amazing lifestyle. Uh, it is, you know, and it's kind of a double-edged sword because it allows you more freedom you know, during normal business hours, but it also allows people to kind of, uh, I guess, and, you know, kind of encroach on your outside business hours with feeling like it's no big deal. As an entrepreneur, what, what kind of liberty is that brought into your life? So obviously you're, you're working hard, but, um, you know, have there been drawbacks and how do you, how do you manage all of that? Freedom of technology, I think is, is awesome just because, you know, even like October, you know, I went down with my wife and kid to Florida and I, I don't even think I turned my auto office on the whole time just because I was, you know, I mean, I, it's nice to set your phone down for a couple hours and you know, I should probably learn to do that more. But, uh, you know, I would just get up in the morning and especially be in East Coast time, you know, you know I, but then at the same time, it's almost like you never really can take a vacation because if you have the access there, you know, you feel like you can't turn it off. Yeah. Um, Whereas, you know, I go to, I usually go fishing in Canada once a year, way up in Northwest Ontario. And I remember the first year I went there, we were all stressed out because we had all these mortgage files going and we were worried about, oh, you know, what's going to happen because we didn't have as many people working for us then either. And they were supposed to have satellite, satellite internet up there. And then we got up there and it went out like a couple days before we arrived and they weren't getting the new router in. And so we we literally had like no phone, no email in the middle of Northwest Ontario. And so all we had to do was hang out and fish and drink beer for a whole week, which was awesome. (laughs) And, you know, and we got back to land, you know, back to where we had Wi-Fi in uh, Red Lake, Ontario and checked our email and you know what, you know, nothing blew up. It wasn't that big of a deal. And so it just kind of showed you that, you know, you can disconnect for a week, but now sure enough, every year I go up there, they have like Wi-Fi through the whole camp now and you can, you know, FaceTime and, <laughs> you know, you got your phone dinging and it's really, you know, the only time you're truly free is when you're actually out in the boat fishing and, uh, you know, and your phone doesn't work out there. Right. Uh, you know, so sometimes you kind of wish you could go back to like, I remember my dad, you know, he would come home from work and I mean, he was literally like what, eight to five, nine to five, whatever it was. You go in the next morning and you check your, you know, your little tape recorder uh, answering machine. And that was, and that was the deal, you know, and your weekends were, you truly had your weekends off and your nights off and everything else. But at the same time, I mean, I think, I don't know if people even realized it yet, but I think if you work, you know, if you're a hard worker and you, you know, keep your overhead low and, and the money that you do make, you invest wisely. I don't see any reason why people got to work more than like 20 years unless they want to. Yeah. Literally, I mean, if I, you know, as long as everything plays out and there's no huge market catastrophes, I don't see why I couldn't retire in the next like three to five years. Um, you know, if I want to, I don't, I think that'd be kind of boring to be honest, but you know, I'd still want to do something, you know, if you're not afraid of it and you use it wisely, uh, 
Yeah, I think everybody could retire a little bit earlier. Can you tell us if you have any stories of mistakes that you've made along the way? So something that you thought was going to go well and then uh, had a, a learning experience, as they call it. Uh, you know, fortunately, we haven't had too many missteps yet. Uh, you know, I mean, I think, I mean, I think my only regret is maybe not doing it earlier, going out on my own. You know, I spent about three years at Geico where I could have been out doing this, but at the same time, I almost wonder, you know, money was so easy to get back then where if I would have maybe got myself in a bad spot, if it had been out in a big city like Denver, Colorado, you know, with basically just doing no money down loans and buying whatever I felt like it. Right. Yeah, the, definitely an element of risk when you're talking about yeah, large assets. And, mm-hmm. and like we just got a permit to build our new office um, up on Tennyson Street in Berkeley. And, uh, you know, I guess this is an interview, so hopefully I'm not spilling too many beans on our company. But it's, uh, you know, our, our whole concept there is kind of similar to how I like doing my personal housing is, you know, we're building basically out, you know, multi, multi-unit multi mixed-use project. And, you know, our whole goal is we should be able to sell off the remaining units short of our, our office itself. And that will actually give us our office for free. So, wow. you know, right now we have, you know, we have, we have a pretty affordable office we're at right now, still, you know, kind of down lower Highlands neighborhood. So good spot, but yep. you know, if you can get your, your business to where you don't even, where you own the building as well. I mean, that just puts you on a whole other level as well. So all of a sudden you start dropping another you know, it all depends on your business. But for us, if we drop an extra 60 grand to the bottom line because we actually own the building um, and can rent out internal space to other loan officers, real estate agents, or even even other trades that we work with a lot, like architects, builders, engineers, um, you know, I mean, you actually might make money on your office, which, I mean, how many businesses are doing that? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that's kind of, it just goes back to kind of how I've been trying to structure my own personal, you know, housing overhead and, uh, it should work out well. We got our permit a couple weeks ago and yeah, yeah. Maybe I'm just cheap. I don't know, but it's, <laughs> uh, but it's been, it's worked well for me, you know, since I've, you know, I'm not, I'm not really, I'm only 35. So, you know, I've got, I've got plenty of mistakes to make, but, uh, it's been a good business model for me. Yeah. But it seems if you apply that, uh, keeping costs low, the, the mistakes at least will be minimal. So yeah. Yeah. And I know big companies can't do that. You know, they have to have those huge campuses and other stuff, but yeah, you know, it's even like I see first bank around town and they, they put up all these buildings, commercial buildings with these, uh, on these great zonings where they could go three, five, eight stories. And they just put these little one story banks on there. Yeah. I, I've noticed, uh, driving around Denver to some of those first banks and just thought like, what a waste of good real estate. Yeah. yeah. And they, cause they own their, well, cause they own their real estate too. It's not like they're leasing from a landlord and uh, right. I'm sure they're not the only example in town, but it's like, why would you not put 10 apartments above your first bank? Yeah, exactly. Cause you know? I mean, in my opinion, the, the banking branch, uh, will pretty much go away. You know, obviously you'll need people to, to do loans and whatnot, but the people depositing money, you know, that can all be done by machines pretty easily. So you got Bitcoin, so, online banking, no, I agree. It's just, yeah, to me, it just seems like kind of, you know, they could have done a little bit more there, but yeah. Can you share with us a tool hack or shortcut that helps you succeed? Uh, Dropbox was a big game changer. Dropbox. And and how yeah. do you use Dropbox? Well, it, uh, you know, it used to be, you'd have to like send a file to yourself to get it on another computer. Um, but I mean, Dropbox is just great. I mean, I can have all my files, you know, whether it's you know, architectural plans or somebody's real estate file or whatever, right on my iPhone, laptop, basically any computer, you know, that I have access to that increased our efficiency, like tenfold easy. What book have you given away as a gift the most often? I don't know if I've really given any books as gifts, but, uh, actually I would say rich dad, poor dad, rich dad, poor dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Um, Cool. We'll, we'll link to that in the show notes. Yeah, that was a great book. And then uh, I love all the free economics books too. I think those they're are cool. Good. Or anything Malcolm Gladwell. But yeah. uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad is kind of the one that really got my wheels turned. I think I read it when I was a senior in college. And uh, that, you know, I already I knew real estate was good, but that one was that one kind of really, I don't know, it tripped something in my brain to get get moving on it. Who would you say is the most influential entrepreneur, a role model in your life? You know, it's kind of cheesy, but I would almost say my dad. Just because, I, I had a feeling that was where you're going to go. You know, I mean, I think, you know, it's kind of a, 
cliche thing to say, but you know, I just saw him. I remember going to going to church growing up, and uh, he, I mean, he would often go to church with us. But some days he was just so busy working his tail off on the weekends trying to get his apartments, you know, ready to lease or you know whatever he was doing on them. And you know, we would go to McDonald's or something and bring him, you know, an egg muffin after church and just see him see him working on his stuff and. And, uh, you know, I, think, I don't know, maybe in a weird way, you know, when you're little, that just kind of shows you that, you know, people don't work nine to five. People are working weekends, nights, whenever just to make things happen. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say my dad, I just saw him, you know, especially when I got, when he got laid off and didn't have to go back to work. I was like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So he's probably 50 years old and just hung it up, not by choice, but he was at least able to. If Chuck Moore was made king, what law would you enact? This might sound like kind of an asshole comment, but everybody needs to contribute. I think there's way too many people sitting around getting a free ride. And so, you know, assuming you are willing and able, I mean, obviously if you're disabled and you can't do anything, that's fine. But I think, you know, everybody, even if you can't work and you're on some sort of subsidy, should have to contribute to, you know, clean up a highway or volunteer to rescue mission or something of that nature, you know, maybe 10 hours a week. Yeah, uh, but just something to kind of get, you know, kind of get the get the wheels turning. And it might just be that you have, you know, those that person has an experience that, you know, all of a sudden something clicks and, you know, their life changes. Sure. Um, it's not really I mean, I don't think it's driven to be, you know, like oh, people are lazy and they need to get out and do something. I just think the more experiences people have and get out and doing stuff, you know, something's going to something's going to click. If there's anything that you'd like to mention or any asks that you had for our audience and then uh, finish up with your contact info, if anyone wants to reach out to you, uh, why they would and how. Yeah, well, I probably talked way more than I was supposed to anyway, so I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up. But yeah, just uh, Charles Moore, Chuck Moore, you know, whatever, whatever you prefer. But uh, I mean, people are welcome to call me on my direct cell phone at 303 303- three oh five nine four zero zero or you can email me at charles m at realtor dot com. Uh and really, you know, just I mean if anybody needs anything real estate related, you know, they're welcome to call me and I you know, I think I can probably be a pretty good resource for them. But uh and that's our, mostly uh, co- Colorado limited, right? Yeah, really Colorado. I mean now we're kinda we're starting to look out in other other states just because we've got some uh some other kind of kind of business opportunities we're talking about that I probably can't really get into right now, but, uh, you know, we're starting to go to other States, but yeah, I mean, as far as my resources, I'm really restricted to Colorado. I got, um, well, yeah, we have a lot of Colorado listeners, so that's perfect. But no, I mean, really in, you know, direct good business referral for us is, you know, anybody that needs a mortgage, whether purchase or refinance, anybody looking to buy a house, um, or sell their house. Um, and then really anybody looking to learn more about development or, you know, in any any buyer that has really an appetite or a stomach, you know, for doing a project. I mean, I've helped, uh, for instance, my buddy Brad do a project where I sold him a house for 190. He did the pop top for a pop top, basically meaning he added a second level addition, gutted the main floor, so he really ended up with a brand new two story house. I think he did that for 200, and I hooked him up with contractors and everything on it. So total total all in project of 400. And his appraisal came back at 550, you know, so in a market where people are, you know, bidding competitively and usually bidding over what a house is probably been worth, you know, there are situations where, you know, if you're willing to, you know, open up your mind and do a project, you know, you can actually walk into a pretty considerable amount of equity in a lot of cases. And as a client of uh, Chuck's, I can attest that it's a great experience and I would highly recommend it. And I've actually recommended a number of friends to, to call them as they're looking into this. So Cool. Appreciate it, Justin. Thank you so much for the time. Have a great evening and hope to talk to you again soon. Yeah, same to you.